Link TV presents Mosaic World News from the Middle East. Here are today's top stories. Yemen's Council of the Revolution's Youth holds first general conference. Sudan's al-Bashir says protests are no Arab Spring as crackdown continues. And Syria warns NATO of conspiring against Damascus. Mosaic, world news from the Middle East begins now. In Yemen, the Council of the Revolution's Youth started its first general conference in Sana'a with the aim of forming a clear vision for the youth project. The Presidential Communication Commission, formed by interim president Abdurrabu Mansour Hadi to hold a dialogue with the youth, was accused by Yemeni revolutionary coalitions of including thugs loyal to deposed Yemeni president Ali Abdullah Saleh. The first annual conference of a revolutionary coalition called the Council of the Revolution's Youth is being held in the Yemeni capital, Sana'a. It was convened to manage discussions held in different governorates on the role of the revolutionary youth in the transitional phase and aims to form a clear vision of their plan to build a modern Yemeni state. The changing face of the revolution must be taken into account, and that means that this revolution, its concepts and its goals must reach all the people so that it becomes a social revolution. The conference was initiated after holding a debate and heated discussions that sometimes escalated to fistfights. The youth refused what they called the attempts by the presidential commission, which was formed by President Abu Mansour Hadi, to include in the dialogue those that they describe as the thugs of the deposed Yemeni president's party. They add that the Gulf Initiative stipulated that the dialogue must be held between the youth of the revolution and the government. The presidential commission denied these accusations and said that it will take the youth's observation into account. The terms specify that the dialogue should take place between those who did not sign the Gulf Initiative, the Houthis, al Hirak, and the youth. We want to be treated like the Houthis and al Hirak as one entity under the banner of revolutionary youth. The intense dialogue coincides with protests held almost daily in which thousands participate. They roam the lively streets of the capital and other cities to demand the resignation of Saleh's relatives, especially a son who leads the Republican Guards and Special Forces. In addition, they demand the release of the detainees as a prerequisite for holding a dialogue with the government. According to observers, the situation hinges on how serious and committed the political parties are to include the youth in the country's political future. According to the Gulf Initiative, the dialogue was supposed to be held between the government and the revolutionary youth. However, the youth are accusing certain elements from the former regime of seeking to disrupt the process and include the deposed president's loyalists in the dialogue. Ahmed Al Shalafi, Al Jazeera, Sanaa. Cautious calm is dominating the streets of the Sudanese capital only hours after Sudanese President Omar al-Bashir warned that security forces will be deployed to confront the protesters. Al-Bashir dismissed the economic crisis as a reason for the anti-government protests and accused agitators of being behind them. The opposition condemned al-Bashir's position, saying his rule has started to dwindle. Our correspondent Sami al Shanawi reports from Al-Khartoum. Deviance. This is how the Sudanese president described the demonstrators in Al Khartoum squares while ruling out that protests over the deteriorating living conditions are an Arab Spring. And while there was no mention of mobilizing jihadist groups, the ruling party said it will use the security option to deal with the demonstrators by setting up training bases to counter the conspiracy against the country. <laughs> When the Sudanese people revolt, they really revolt. The people who are burning tires are a few agitators and deviants. Some people came out to the street 
but we know who the real jihadists are. Despite the threats and warnings, the scene of protests continues to dominate the country's squares that are bracing for further escalations, especially considering that al-Bashir's reforms are not suitable to deal with the suffocating economic crisis looming in the country. We are not deviants. Those who took to the streets are not deviants. They are the sons and the daughters of the Sudanese people. They have specific demands. The wave of demonstrations will escalate in the coming days. They will be peaceful. The opposition believes that al-Bashir's remarks indicate that the reign of his regime is dwindling at the security, political and economic levels. It seems that the ruling regime's options are limited, especially amid the suffocating economic situation, which is continuing to pull the opposition, the government and the demonstrators further apart, leaving the door open to all possibilities. Sami al Shanawi, Dubai TV, Al Khartoum. Syria says it is against a NATO meeting due to take place in Turkey on Tuesday because of outward hostility towards Damascus. Is with these intentions, we uh, wish them all the best if it's for the sake of security and stability. We heard NATO previously saying it doesn't intend to intervene militarily in Syria. If the aim of the NATO meeting is a hostile aim, I'd like to reassure everyone that Syrian territories and Syrian airspace and Syrian waters are holy for the Syrian people, just like the Turkish uh, territories and Turkish waters are holy for the Turkish people. Syria's foreign ministry spokesman says Damascus will always defend its borders and at any cost. His words come after Turkey called for a NATO emergency meeting on the downing of its warplane by Syria. Jihad Magdisi says the plane failed to identify itself while well inside Syria's airspace. Turkey denies this, saying the warplane was in international airspace. Back on Friday, a Turkish F-4 Phantom fighter jet was downed by Syria in what Damascus calls self-defense. And now Turkey is holding a cabinet meeting to discuss a response. Ankara is still looking for the pilots as their fate remains unknown. The European Union announces plans to go ahead with an oil embargo against Iran over its nuclear program. The sanctions that have been agreed will be implemented from the 1st of July, an embargo on Iranian oil imports. Catherine Ashton's remarks come as Tehran and the P5 plus one are engaged in negotiations over Iran's nuclear program. The new sanctions will take effect only days before a new round of talks in Turkey. The U.S. and some of its allies accuse Iran of seeking nuclear weapons, a claim Tehran strongly rejects. It insists its nuclear program is purely civilian. The International Atomic Energy Agency's inspections of Iran's nuclear sites have also proven the non-diversion of Iran's nuclear activities. Iran says the unilateral sanctions are illegal and only affect ordinary Iranians. Among many instances are the West's embargo on passenger planes and the financial sector, which has affected pharmaceutical imports. The Syrian Observatory for Human Rights said 41 people were killed today in the shelling and clashes in many Syrian regions. The shelling continued on the neighborhoods of Homs as the Free Syrian Army warned against an attack on the city by regime soldiers and against what it referred to as a massacre. For its part, the General Revolution's General Commission reported that the city of Talbisa and Homs province is also being heavily shelled. Meanwhile, Syrian National Council sources and Turkish media confirmed that 33 Syrian soldiers defected from the Syrian army yesterday, including a major general and two colonels who crossed into the Turkish territory. Heavy artillery shelling and rockets are targeting al Hamidiya as explosions are rocking the neighborhood and columns of smoke were seen rising. 
كما استمرت الاشتباكات في الخلدية وجرة الشياح ودير بعلبة عدم تمكن منظمات الإغاثة من دخول حمص دفع المجلس العسكري. Relief organizations were unable to enter homes, which led to the Free Syrian Army's High Military Council to warn Arab and Muslim states and international organizations that the regime is carrying out what it called a massacre in homes. In an appeal by the National Council, it said the events in homes constitute what it called mass annihilation that has been going on for 20 days. In Dira Zor, clashes continued in the area of Al Jubalaya, Al Hamadiya, Al Aldeh, Al Alamal, and Sheikh Yassin as regime forces continue the operations. This comes as the official Syrian TV confirmed the regime is fighting what it described as armed terrorist groups that are targeting vital facilities and oil lines in that region. Clashes also continued in the neighborhoods of Al Khader and Tariq Alab in Hama, leading to casualties. Civilians were also killed in Kufar Runbul and Marat al Nuaman in the countryside of Idlib as confrontations continued in other regions. According to opposition videos uploaded online, the authenticity of which cannot be verified, a police station was attacked in Al Khandura in the countryside of Aleppo. Following the attack, the sergeant defected from the station and handed himself over to members of the Free Army on camera. Al Humara in Duma is being shelled by Syrian regime forces trying to take control of the region. As for the countryside of Dora, the village of Maroda was subjected to shelling with helicopters in the government's attempt to control the village, according to the Syrian Observatory for Human Rights. Many regions continue to protest since the early morning, despite the Syrian security forces' use of force to disperse the demonstrators, even in sensitive areas including Damascus, Hama and Al-Sahel. Also in Al Sahel, Syrian TV said what it described as a terrorist group was captured by government forces in Latakia. The group is responsible for a number of operations that targeted civilians, including children. Hayan Yakub, BBC. Egyptian President-elect Mohamed Morsi said the revolution is continuing until all of its goals are achieved. He also confirmed that his country will not interfere in the internal affairs of any other country. Morsi said he will work on building relations with all countries on the basis of respect and mutual interests. Celebrations swept most of the country's governorates. Egypt is festive after the Muslim Brotherhood's candidate, Mohamed Morsi, was announced as Egypt's first post-revolution president. Here, in central Cairo's Tahrir Square, as in most squares and cities of the country, different Egyptians celebrated in their own way. Some chanted God is great, others celebrated to the tune of popular music, while some set off fireworks. Hundreds of Egyptian flags were raised to rejoice in this historic event, which is the culmination of months of struggle that ended an era of injustice and tyranny. Mohamed Morsi is responsible for us, and we are responsible for him, God willing. If he makes a mistake, we will evaluate him. The Egyptian people are very happy because for the first time they are able to express their will and choose their president on their own. The Egyptian people chose their president for the first time, so they elected Mohamed Morsi as Egypt's first post-revolution president. He is the fifth president after Mohamed Naguib, Gamal Abdel Nasser, Anwar al-Sadat, and Hosni Mubarak. In his first speech to the people after his victory, he vowed to be a president for all Egyptians without any discrimination, assuring that the revolution is continuing. I am now a president for all Egyptians, wherever they are, in the country or abroad. I will reach out to all Egyptians. The revolution is continuing until all its goals are achieved.
Morsi also vowed to respect Egypt's treaties and international charters and not to interfere in the internal affairs of other countries. He said he will work on building relations with countries around the world on the basis of respect and mutual interests. We will respect international treaties and charters and all pacts and obligations between Egypt and the entire world. We will not allow ourselves to interfere in the internal affairs of any country, as we will not allow any interference in our affairs. Egypt has entered a new phase in its history by electing the first civilian president for the country that has been ruled by the military since 1952. expressed almost unanimous concern about the victory of the Muslim Brotherhood rising to power in Egypt. The newspaper headline in Yediot read, Darkness in Egypt, with one commentator calling it a dangerous development for Israel. Ma'ariv lamented the new Middle East, the fear has become reality, the peace treaty has been put in doubt. Yaakov Katz of the Jerusalem Post wrote that Morrissey's election had altered Israel's defense realities and could affect the growing terror threat in the Sinai. Jerusalem residents were hopeful, but not optimistic. I think that we have to give him a chance. I think I'm, I'm a little bit worried. I'm actually, in some ways, I'm more worried for the Egyptians. I don't think they, all of them know what they have actually voted for. Um, I don't think they're used to being a religious country, but I don't think that he's there as extreme as maybe some of our fears are. In, in this stage, we don't know what uh, will be. We hope so that his uh, face is to peace, and uh, it will be a pragmatic. And if it will be like that, so we welcome him. But if not, so it's a problem. So we hope that uh, he will be pragmatic and uh, he will uh, act for peace. In an act of historic cooperation between Russia and Israel, Presidents Vladimir Putin and Shimon Peres together unveiled a monument commemorating the Russian army's victory over Nazi Germany in World War II. It was Putin's first visit to Israel since 2005 and included a diplomatic summit between the Russian leader and Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. IBA's Eli Wagalanter has been following developments today. He joins me now in the studio. Eli? Thank you, Yochanan. At this hour, Russian President Vladimir Putin and Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu are holding a news conference, having just finished their meeting at the Prime Minister's residence in Jerusalem in talks that were extended by over two hours. The two leaders centered their discussion on Russia's policy of propping up Syrian President Bashar Assad in Syria and on the nuclear talks with Iran. Putin's visit is designed to send a clear message to the world. Russia is a key player in the Middle East and one that needs to be taken into account. Earlier today, Putin headed for Netanya immediately upon landing at Ben Gurion Airport, where he was greeted by Foreign Minister Viktor Lieberman and an IDF honor guard. In Netanya, Putin helped inaugurate a memorial for Soviet troops killed in World War II. The inauguration ceremony was attended by President Shimon Peres, Minister Lieberman, his Russian counterpart Sergei Lavrov, and other Israeli and Russian ministers. Putin told the crowd of some 600 people, the white rock dove symbolizes the triumph of good and peace. May these values always serve as the basis for friendship between our nations. Peres called the monument a beacon of hope, adding Russia, who so greatly helped win the war, is the same Russia that can help peace in the Middle East. Paris stressed Russia's involvement in the international dialogue with Iran and said that man's dignity will not be trampled over again. I am sure that as a fighter against fa fascism, Russia will not allow similar threats, not an Iranian threat or Syrian bloodshed. Paris will host a state dinner this evening in the Russian leader's honor. Tomorrow, Putin will, head, will meet with Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas and also hold talks with Jordan's King Abdullah. Putin will unveil a Russian cultural center in Bethlehem and open a guest house for Christian pilgrims in Jordan. Under the supervision of the Interior Ministry-run Palestinian Center for Mine Action, experts from the United Nations started training security members on means to clear landmines. The program will last three weeks and is held in the field of the Institute of Public Security Forces in the city of Jericho.
هذا حقل افتراضي للالغام الارضيه يتدرب فيه افراد This is a supposed landmine field where members of police, civil defense and national security institutions are training on how to handle and clear landmines in accordance with the principles of security and safety. Dozens of Palestinians have been victims of landmines left by the occupation's army. فلسطين بشكل عام موبوءة بحقول الألغام في كافة. Palestine as a whole is infested with minefields. Landmines were planted in all the cities, villages, and refugee camps of the West Bank, even in the agricultural areas. And with the recurrent injuries and deaths by landmines, it became necessary for us and the national authority to take the decision to remove these landmines. God willing, the team will soon be able to handle landmines in real fields. ويمتد برنامج تدريب هؤلاء المختصين على إزالة الألغام لأربعة أسابيع. The program extends to training these demining specialists for four weeks under the supervision of experts from the United Nations and the Palestinian Center for Mine Action, so they will be capable of executing their mission professionally, knowledgeably, and competently. Now each team. Each team consists of technical experts in clearing landmines for the United Nations. I believe the levels of these trainees is very high, and so far, I'm very happy with their level. They have the capacity for EOD. For the training program on disposing and removing mines to be successful, trainees must be familiar and aware of the landmine sizes and various types, and be able to distinguish them and know how to dismantle them, but the available capacities for practicing are limited. With extreme caution and high accuracy, the trainees are carrying out the operational steps on how to locate the landmines underground and dispose of them to spare our people their dangers and horrors. The distance between this training field and the Jordanian-Palestinian border is a short one, and the border region is infested with thousands of tons of explosives of different types. The day will come when these security members and soldiers will be working to remove these mines in an independent Palestinian state with Palestinian know-how. Fati Baraha, Palestine TV, Jericho. The views expressed on Mosaic are from contributing broadcasters, not Link TV or its sponsors. The production of Mosaic is made possible by grants from the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation, the Winco Foundation, the Firedall Foundation, and by support of viewers like you. Thank you. Watch Mosaic World News online. Stay up to date with breaking news, read our blog, get transcripts of past shows and more at linktv.org slash mosaic. channel of uncompromising stories, world news, documentaries, entertainment, and culture. Link TV, connecting you to the world. For more information, visit linktv.org.